Stuck on Interstate 95 and sub-freezing cold for more than 27 hours. That's the nightmare scenarios travelers face during an unprecedented shutdown of one of the nation's busiest highways. A U.S. senator was among those trapped in their cars in the massive traffic jam that spanned dozens of miles. And now another storm bringing more treacherous weather is on the way. Charlene Aaron brings us the details. Interstate 95 in Northern Virginia is moving again. The highway finally reopening last night after a 50-mile traffic jam that froze hundreds of cars in place over two days. Just as the region is recovering from Monday's winter storm, more bad weather is on the way, complete with possible freezing rain along that same section of I-95. It was a nightmare on one of the nation's busiest highways as snow and ice caused I-95 to shut down, trapping drivers in sub-freezing temperatures for more than 27 hours. Vehicles starting to run out of gas. Food, water is an issue for some of these people. It started with multiple tractor trailers jackknifing near Fredericksburg, Virginia, as temperatures dropped below freezing, made worse by heavy snowfall. Our cell phones don't work. Um, internet goes in and out. So it's we've just been sitting here. I've been in this spot for seven hours, almost eight hours. Some drivers taking to social media, worrying about a lack of gas, food, and water. I'm just more worried that I'm going to run out of gas because when I run out of gas, then I run out of warmth and phone battery. Virginia Senator Tim Kaine was stuck in his car for 27 hours after starting his normally two-hour commute to the Capitol. I had a heavy coat, and I also had a full tank of gas. And the problem is a lot of people, when you're stuck that long between, you know, five miles from an interchange and the traffic isn't moving, folks are running out of gas. The Virginia Department of Transportation calling the situation unprecedented. We were not able to pre-treat our roadways before, before, and this is due to the rain. The rain would have washed all of our chemicals and salt off the road. Virginia Governor Ralph Northam defending the state's handling of the chaos, saying there was difficulty getting workers and equipment through the snow and ice. Meanwhile, forecasters warn more freezing rain for that same area Wednesday, and another storm is expected to bring snow from Virginia to Maine later this week. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, I've lived in states that have a lot of snow, and the drivers know how to, how to deal with it, and, and the states know how to deal with it, and the snow plows are always running and trying to keep the roadways clear, and people know what to do in case of an accident. Uh, unfortunately, in Virginia, snow seems to be so rare that uh, I, my general advice to all Virginians, if it's snowing outside, stay home uh, because there are people out there that really don't know how to drive in the snow. And then if there is some kind of pileup like this, you're going to be waiting for a very long time. All that said, 23 hours? Are you kidding me? Uh, you can't get a tractor trailer uh, a snarl up uh, taken care of in that kind of time frame. Um, it, it shouldn't take that much time. You come in on one of the other uh, exits ahead of that wreck and you, you try to clear it as soon as you can. If you can't get to it, you get the snow plows out and working. Now, is this a case of uh, you didn't have enough employees or were, were people out with COVID, all those other things? Uh, it just seems to be the new normal of the, uh, the whole nation where crazy things are happening, crazy weather is happening, and then we seem to be very hampered in our response. Well, in other news, Senate Democrats are attempting to weaken the filibuster, and they're facing pushback from both sides of the aisle. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That is right, Gordon. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is threatening to change the rules for the filibuster to pass nationwide Democrat-backed election reforms. The effort has been stalled for months in the evenly divided Senate, lacking the 60 votes needed to overcome a Republican filibuster. On Tuesday, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell called plans to scrap the procedural rule a radical move that threatens to break the Senate. Based on what the Majority Leader said, he's going to try to break the Senate break the legislative filibuster to make some kind of narrow exception. There is no such thing as a narrow exception. This, in my view, is genuine radicalism. 
Schumer needs all 50 Democrats to vote in favor to make the change. West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin has signaled that he might not be on board if there are no uh, if there's no bipartisan support. Senator Manchin was the one who put the brakes on President Biden's multi-trillion dollar social spending bill before Christmas, and one poll shows 61 percent of West Virginians support his stand. CBN contributor Chuck Holton traveled to the Mountain State to hear what some of them had to say. Democrats still hope to pass some form of Joe Biden's signature Build Back Better program after lone Democrat Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia basically doomed it. I'm not going to negotiate in public on this because I've been dealing in good faith and I will continue to deal in good faith with all of my colleagues on both sides. It's time to pass the bill and quit playing games. West Virginia voted overwhelmingly for Donald Trump in the last election, so it's no surprise that people in small towns like this across the state are applauding Manchin's no vote on the Build Back Better program. But it also shows that Manchin himself would like to keep his job. Don't you have to love anyone who's a gadfly and a thorn in the side of the Washington establishment? But the fact that federal government has never shown itself to be able to do the things that it needs to do efficiently and someone to put their hand up and say, wait a minute, let's take our time with this. And you know how frustrated it makes them and how it makes them gnash their teeth because unfortunately they're more about their reelection than they are about actually helping people is something to, it's really a thing of beauty. I have very mixed feelings. I, I, I think that there's a role for the government involved in infrastructure repair that's very, very important and needed. I think the Senate Democrats are opposed to independent thinking, and I believe that's what Senator Manchin's done. I'm not always in agreement with him. This time I am. The fact that Manchin is increasingly at odds with his party has many West Virginians wondering why he doesn't just become a Republican. My grandfather was a Democrat. My father was a Democrat. It's only natural that I would become a Democrat, and I was for a lot of years, but I figured the only way to be a good Democrat was to become a Republican because the Republicans are where the Democrats was 40 years ago. From Southern West Virginia, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Thanks, Chuck. Turning now to Israel, where an 11-year-old girl recently made a significant archaeological find. The discovery sheds new light on what life was like in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell reports. In the Emek Zurim Park, visitors can sift through debris from the ongoing excavation in the city of David. That's where Liel Krudekop found a rare silver coin from the time of the Second Temple. It's filled something not normal. And I um, go to their archaeologic was there and he cleaned it a little bit and then he told me and for my family that's a silver coin. At first, Liel's father thought they should throw it away. Actually, it didn't look like a coin, so I was thinking to myself, this is some kind of stone, and actually I told to the girls, put it in the garbage can, but they insisted that this is a coin, and they took the coin to the archaeologist that was on the site, and he confirmed that this is indeed a coin. I was very excited, and it's like some happy feel because somebody touched it before 2,000 years and right now I'm touched. This is a very rare find. Together with this silver coin, we know from the archaeological documentation only 30 other silver coins from the rebellion. The coin has two Hebrew inscriptions. We can see the words in ancient Hebrew, Shekel Israel, and a second line with two Hebrew letters, Shin Bet, which means the second year of the rebellion against the Romans, 67 8 AD. On the other side of the coin, we have another inscription in ancient Hebrew, which says, Leirushalayim Akdusha, to Holy Jerusalem. Archaeologists believe the high priest in the temple wanted the coin to help pay for the revolt against the Romans. Coins were minted in order to emphasize independence of certain communities. So the Jews that they rebelled against the Romans wanted to emphasize that they are independent. The Hebrew wording on the coin harkens back to the first temple for a reason. To the time of King David and his son King Solomon. The Jews wanted to emphasize their connection to the great kingdom of Israel led by King David. 
They missed it. They wanted their kingdom to be as large as King David kingdom. The coin came from a layer of debris dating to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. I'm standing on the remains of uh, the ancient pilgrimage road that led Jews from all over the world to the temple itself. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the street itself, all the structures that stood on both sides of this street collapsed into one pile. To Levy, the discovery is like traveling back in time. To hold this silver coin is like going back 2,000 years ago and actually touching the common, the daily life of the people that lived in Jerusalem. Liel's mother sees it as more proof of Jewish life in Jerusalem. It tells a lot about the history, about the people that lived here, about everything, uh, about the history of this place, of Jerusalem, and the meaning of this place to us, to, to the Israelis, to the Jewish people. So yes, it means a lot. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Time travel with the help of an 11-year-old girl. And Gordon, thank goodness they resisted the urge to throw it away. Yeah, that's uh, an amazing story. Here's a coin from 68 AD, two years before the destruction of the temple. And they're crying out for the restoration of the kingdom. In our lifetime, something amazing happened. Uh, actually, it's not in my lifetime. It was 10 years before I was born. But back in 1948, can a nation be born in a day? And Israel was born in a day, the restoration of the kingdom. Uh, and now we pray for the restoration of the king. Can we believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah? That would be wonderful to see. He saw the 700 Club on television in a fraternity house. Well, that's how Barrymore heard the message that changed his life. A week later, he met his future bride, and they began a journey together that led to the U.S. House of Representatives. Abigail Robertson brings us more on their remarkable story. Congressman Barry Moore grew up in a church community, although like many teenagers, straight away from his faith, until God got his attention in a place he least expected. I was actually in a fraternity house in Auburn, Alabama, of all places. Interesting things are happening. This is in the Pat Robertson. It was on the TV. Just do it right now. Bow your head. At the time, Barry wasn't really close to the Lord. There was just something he said that day in the 700 Club. I was just watching the TV, and I found myself prone before the Lord with tears in a fraternity house. And uh, that began that process, I think, of kind of redirecting my path. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God's timing was perfect because about a week later, Barry met his future wife. I actually told my best friend I would not go out with Barry Moore if he was the last guy on earth. <laughs> and then 10 months later, we were married. At first, Barry's wife, Heather, expressed skepticism about his conversion. Barry just kind of seemed like this wild guy. I'm like, is this guy for real? Like, is he for real trying to convince me that he was watching Pat Robertson in his fraternity house? And sure enough, it was true. And so that kind of started mine and Barry's relationship. 30 years later, both are confident God called them to be together. We're a good team. And I think that her understanding politics and having a passion for that and me just uh, being a country poor from South Alabama being called, I tell everybody I was in the garbage business, but the transition from garbage to politics was pretty easy to make. So the Lord kind of called me into this life. But politics wasn't always a part of their plan. It was the last thing on earth I thought I ever wanted to do. I actually told the party no in 2006 when they asked me to run for the state legislature. Two years later, Barry had a change of heart. In 2008, we felt like, the I, I think it was President Obama said we're no longer a Christian nation. We are no longer a Christian nation. I told Heather, I said, we, we must engage. We cannot sit on the sideline any longer. It really did something to Barry. And he said, you know what? If they ask me to run again, I might do it. Because if Christians don't engage this process, we're going to be left out. We're going to be left behind and we're going to lose our nation. In 2010, Barry got elected to the state legislature. The Lord just kind of directed our paths to do that. And then so... Through that process, I became labeled the most dependable conservative vote in the legislature. In 2014, that put a bullseye on my back. During his first reelection campaign, 
Barry was arrested on charges of felony perjury. I became uh, indicted. I was facing 40 years in prison, and that was the process where the Lord really began to transform me. Planning to drop out of the race, Barry's family stepped in, encouraging him to stand and fight. I think I could have cut a deal and walked away, mm -hmm. but, but because of my 12-year-old son, not my team of attorneys, but my 12-year-old son and his faith in the book of Daniel, how Daniel and those guys stood, that we needed to go through the fiery furnace. And so, you know, I tell everybody we came out without even the smell of smoke. Barry won his reelection before he was found not guilty on all charges. I can honestly say that every single one of my kids will tell you that it was the worst year of their life, but they will, every single one of them will tell you that they grew in their faith and that they have a solid confidence in God to carry them through their lives from that experience. And for that, I'm grateful. After the trial, Barry wanted out of politics, but God had other plans. No doubt I wanted to get out, no doubt. While in DC for President Trump's inauguration, a couple stopped Barry at breakfast and prophesied over him. And the Lord says that even as Moses was reluctant to take the mantle that God had placed upon you, but God says, I'm gonna give you the wisdom and the understanding that you need to do what I call you to do. It was that prophecy that January 21st prophecy that gave me so much encouragement to be here now, and those people didn't know me from Adam. Barry decided to run for U.S. Congress in 2018, but he lost. I could not let it go. God kept telling me, Barry's gonna be in Congress. Two years later, while Heather was driving, God told her a door was about to open. Two days later, Barry called me and said that our Congresswoman was retiring. And I said, well, you're running. And he said, no, we need to, I said, no. God spoke to me two days ago and said a calling was coming and that we don't walk, we run. And he said, well, okay then. Barry ran again, barely making it into a primary runoff. He's in Congress by 605 votes. And the next person up had 20% more than we did. Still, he somehow won the nomination and election. I will never, ever not be amazed at being here and how God brought us here. In Congress, Barry and Heather continue to go where God leads them. Man, we do not have the answers for the future of our country. The Republicans nor the Democrats, no matter how smart we are, how brilliant we are, how good a public speaker we are, to save this nation, we must turn back to him. Congressman Moore says one thing he's learned on the Hill is while he can't make as big of a difference as he'd like, he's trusting God in the process and seeking him for wisdom on how to lead our country forward. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, if God is calling you into politics, you have my every sympathy because you are going to go through the lion's den. It's become a full contact sport, and some would even say it's become a blood sport. What happened to Barry was that they literally indicted him uh, for, quote, lying to a grand jury. And he was ultimately acquitted on all counts, but his whole family had to go through that. And it isn't wonderful. His son comes to him and said, I've just been reading about Daniel and how we need to stand. And that got him through. The pressure that's put on criminal defendants now to accept plea deals uh, is absolutely enormous. And he, he, based on what his son told him, said, no, we're not going to do that. And we're going to push through. And what a, what a wonderful testimony. That testimony can be yours as well if you just hold on to God. We as a nation, let me echo what Barry said, we as a nation, it's not going to come through a political solution. Hear me clearly. It's not going to come through a political solution. If God's called you to politics, please respond to that. Please say yes and be willing to put everything on the line because that's the cost of, of, of obeying the call. But the real thing that's going to happen, what's really going to change our nation is when we as a people call out to him and turn from our wicked ways. That's what we need to do. We need full-on repentance in America today. We need to turn back to God. We need to obey his commandments and obey his voice. If we will do that, this wonderful promise, righteousness exalts a nation. No one can claim today that America is righteous. Let us turn that around. Let us be righteous in what we do, righteous in what we do as a people, 
righteous in our, our laws, righteous, righteousness in our foreign policy, righteousness in everything we do. If we do that and then walk humbly before the Lord your God, let's act with justice, love, mercy, walk humbly, but most importantly, let us be righteous today. If we can do that and if we can convince people to do that, well, God has wonderful things for us. If we don't, if we continue down our path, well, you can expect more of the same. Why are there so many plagues? Why are so many disasters? Why all these things? Well, we need the protection of God. The word that my father had, God has ways to protect the righteous. In the middle of all the plagues of Egypt, the people who lived in Goshen, the Israelites, were protected. So let's claim that. Let's claim protection over the righteous, but realize we need God. We need to be righteous. Ashley? Headaches, dizziness, nausea. Mike suffered from what his doctor called post-concussion syndrome. It got so bad, he feared he might have to drop out of college. So how was he healed on his way back to campus? Take a look. 19-year-old Mike Pimpo is an active business student at Regent University. On June 19, 2021, Mike was at his summer job at a recycling plant in his hometown of Chicago. While he was helping get a load of boxes unstuck, he had an accident. When I moved the pallet over, one of the boxes fell right on the back of my head as I was sliding it. And it was like a 15 to 20 pound box. I didn't pass out or anything, but I felt really lightheaded. I had trouble like balancing. I felt a little, you know, dizzy at the time and had a headache. Mike went home, took the next day off, and then went back to work. The headaches continued. Two weeks later, he realized he'd gotten worse instead of better. It was very difficult. I was starting to experience a lot more severity of headaches, a lot more nauseousness. So on July 19th, a month after the accident, Mike went to see his doctor in person. They told me that it's actually common where you experience worse symptoms later on. It's called post-concussion syndrome. He told me it would take six months to recover and recommended that I would ice, rest, take Advil, and they also recommended that I do physical therapy. Mike's job gave him workman's comp and also paid for his physical therapy. However, Mike was still experiencing headaches along with memory and focus issues. He was forced to take the rest of the summer off. I wasn't just experiencing dizziness and headaches that wouldn't go away. I didn't feel like myself. I couldn't play sports. I couldn't do what I loved doing. Like if you're really exhausted or dehydrated, that's how I felt, but all the time. As the fall semester got closer, Mike struggled with worry and discouragement. Not only was I worried about the finances, but I was worried about how I'd be able to go to school and just do my math classes and my business classes because I could barely even you know, add a couple numbers, and I'm taking a college algebra class. The heat was also another big deal for me. Virginia in August is really hot. I wouldn't have been able to walk to class. Since Mike believed God called him to pursue a degree at Regent, he sought God's help in prayer. One of the things that God brought to mind was Second Kings. After reading those scripture verses on Naaman and Elisha, it really encouraged me not to give up. Faith is an act of obedience, and uh, I want to remain in obedience uh, to God, not only in my actions, but also in my faith, to believe that God can heal me, to believe that um, despite my injuries, that I'm still going to praise Him. Mike kept the faith and made plans to go back to region in the fall. In August of 2021, his parents were driving him back to campus when Mike's grandfather called. He goes, you know, Mike, Michael, we have great news for you. Pat Robertson was praying for you. I said, really? So he plays the recording, and I hear Pat Robertson say, you know, Money see you got hit in the head. I mean, you were hit strongly, and, and it, was, it was a concussion. And the Lord, uh, they said, there's really nothing they can do. You, you've had this problem, and God right now, just touch your head in the name of, is it Michael? Touch your head right now in Jesus' name, touch him. Immediately, you know, I just sensed the presence of God and received it. I asked my parents if I could drive and, and try it out. 
I drove for a couple hours. It was crazy. It was like I was fine. It blew my mind. But I knew, you know, God's faithful. I was like, wow, I, I think, you know, I believe it, that I'm completely healed. The first day I got to campus, I played basketball. And, you know, I didn't just play basketball. I, you know, I was out here with my friends for like three hours, like three days in the week, <laughs> like spinning around. And <laughs> it, was, uh, it was surreal. Now Mike is thriving and enjoying his business classes at Regent. He's had no ill effects from the concussion since his healing. I believe that God spoke through Pat Robertson in his prayer. God's faithful and he rewards those who diligently seek him. He's a rewarder of our faith. There's no limit to what God can do. Wow, what an awesome story. Hear what Mike said, there's no limit to what God can do for his beloved ones, for his sons, for his daughters, whom he loves so much, so much so that he sent his only begotten son and whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And whatever you're struggling with today, friend, Christ died for you. Whatever ailment you have in your body, it was nailed to the cross. Believe it and receive that today. I pray and I hope that that story has encouraged you in your faith to believe that God can heal you and whatever you're suffering with today. And we've got some more amazing miracles and answer to prayers that I hope encourages you before Gordon and I begin to pray for you. So this is Mary of Portland, Oregon. Uh, she be, became extremely concerned over her memory, which had been deteriorating for about 18 months. And on December 28, 2021, so not that long ago, she was watching the 700 Club and heard Gordon call out her name. He said, a woman named Mary, and you are suffering with confusion. There is a cloud in your thoughts and some memory lapses, and you are worried about dementia. God is healing your brain. Clarity of purpose, clarity of memory is yours right now. As Mary received the word of knowledge, her memory was restored, and she is praising God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here's one from New Mexico. Jimmy suffered with angina. He experienced severe pain in his chest, other areas of the body. And then he was watching the 700 Club back on December 1, so it was about a month ago. She heard, and he heard Ashley, the anointed one, say, there's also someone watching with heart issues. I believe it's angina. The Lord is healing that for you right now. You will not be in pain any longer. You won't have that issue any longer. Just receive the healing now. Well, by faith, Jimmy claimed the word of knowledge and hasn't had any pain since. Isn't that incredible? Praise God. These are miracles. These are miracles. How can someone named Mike be driving along going, saying, in faith, I'm going to go back to school? And I, I, the wisdom that was in Mike. I've never heard anyone express it this way, that, it, you know, faith is, is an act of obedience, uh, that you're, you're being obedient when you act in faith. Isn't that incredible? So here he is. I'm going to be obedient to God. I'm going to go back to school. On the way back, his grandfather calls him and said, there's a word of knowledge for you. You're being called out by name. What happened to you, the accident, the severe concussion, and then the specificity of your name. So as you're acting in obedience, the name is called, the disease is healed, the injury is healed, your brain is restored. Isn't that incredible? Mary, turning on a television set last week, having confusion, having loss of memory, all of these things, and then her name. God knows you by name. He knows every hair on your head. What is he looking for? He's looking for those whose hearts are loyal to him. How do you show that loyalty? Through faith. God, you didn't cause this to happen to me, but you are the solution to what's happened to me. You are getting ready to break through. When your heart is loyal to him, he's looking for that. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro over the whole earth to show himself strong. To who? To those whose hearts are loyal to him. So let's do that. Let's show him. He's looking for it. He's always looking for faith. He always responds to faith. You can have your breakthrough just by believing and then acting on that belief. 
So, Ashley and I are going to pray. Ashley's going to get words of knowledge for you. God's going to break through. He's going to heal you. He's going to have all these wonderful things for you. All you have to do is act your faith. So in an act of faith, lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing and say, I believe God's going to do it for me right now. I believe it. I'm acting it. I'm laying my hand on it right now. I'm believing. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you and we declare you are almighty. We declare you're the answer to every need. We declare your glory is breaking through in our bodies now. We declare your forgiveness, your acceptance, and your healing. So we come boldly to you asking for mercy, asking for healing asking for your glory to be revealed. Stretch forth your hand to do miracles, signs, and wonders, for we ask it in Jesus' name. There's someone you're actually laying both hands on your left knee, and, and as I'm saying this and your hands are on it, you are feeling tingling going through that knee. All of the ligaments are being restored now. Uh, all ACL damage is being healed now. All swelling is going away. All pain just left you. It's healed. It's restored. Everything is normal in that knee. Do what you couldn't do before. You couldn't bend it properly before. Bend it now. Stretch it out. Put your weight on it. Test it. See it. God has healed you in Jesus' name. Yeah, there's a woman watching, Jessica. You actually have your hand over your mouth because mm. the issue is inside your mouth. You have blisters on the back of your throat. It's very painful for you to eat, sleep, chew, food, anything, drink anything. The Lord is healing that for you right now. Just begin to receive that miraculous healing. He sees you. He knows you. He calls you by name. Receive your healing in Jesus' name. There's somebody else watching. You're crying out for God to heal you from hair loss. The Lord sees you. He knows, he knows every hair on your head, and he's going to restore the, the hair loss that you've had. In Jesus' name, receive that. The Lord loves you. In Jesus' name. There's someone you're suffering with a chemical burn, and literally your flesh has been eaten away by it, and God is healing. He's able to restore no more scarring, no more issue, just everything perfectly normal again. Yes. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. Someone else with gallbladder issues, incredibly painful. And God is healing, removing all the stones, all the disease, all the infection, all the inflammation. In Jesus' name, be restored, be rechecked, and realize God has done a great miracle for you. Yeah, other people crying out, hearing that word of somebody being healed from angina. The Lord is healing heart problems and heart issues today. Whatever that looks like for you, receive your healing in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. If someone, you're in the hospital, you have bleeding on the brain. Uh, doctors haven't been able to locate uh, exactly which blood vessel is is causing the problem, and so in Jesus' name, he knows exactly where it is. He is healing it, sealing it off right now. No more damage to your brain cells. Everything's going to be normal. You're going to awaken and be in perfect health, perfect movement, perfect speech, perfect everything. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do for us. Your, your mercy is new every morning. We thank you for it. Be with us now. Bless us now. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen, amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. 1-800-700-7000. If you need prayer, we believe in prevailing prayer, the prayer that gets an answer, that doesn't give up, but knows the answer is just on the other side. How do we get there? Well, we want to pray with you, stand in prayer with you. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News break. The COVID wave is reaching new highs as Omicron surges. New infections are at nearly half a million a day. The CDC says 90% of those cases are Omicron. 
President Biden repeating his call for Americans to get vaccinated. Meanwhile, the White House is stepping up its purchase of Pfizer's antiviral drug from 10 million to 20 million treatments. Turning overseas to Asia, North Korea has launched a ballistic missile off its east coast. The missile flew about 310 miles before splashing into the waters between North Korea and Japan. U.S. and South Korean intelligence are analyzing the missile's trajectory and track. Analysts say the tests indicate the communist regime is developing new ways to deliver nuclear and other warheads to South Korea, Japan, and U.S. targets in the region. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Gordon and Ashley will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Just a reminder, next Wednesday, January 12th, we'll be featuring your voicemails on this program. Pat and Wendy will be here to answer your questions. To leave a question, all you have to do is call the number on your screen right now. It's 1-800-677-7884. Make sure you guys call today only from now until 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, the number is 800 800- 677-7884. Call today from now until 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Gordon? Well, the story of David and Goliath has thrilled children for centuries. Recently, it led to a profound change in the life of a Muslim boy and his mother. How did it all start? Well, take a look. Nine-year-old Bima was born into a Muslim family in Indonesia, but said he really didn't understand anything about his religion. My parents never taught me about it. One day before COVID-19 hit, Bima was invited to an after-school program supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. There, he received free tutoring and learned about the Bible from CBN's Superbook. The episode about David and Goliath changed his life. Goliath said to David that he would cut him to pieces. But David said, you came to fight me with sword and spear? but I will fight you with the mighty name of God. Bhima showed us how he prayed that day to become a Christian. I prayed, Lord Jesus, I want you to be my savior. I also pray for my family that they would know you too. This now is my God and my savior. Go, Allah, go. Bhima began to change and that triggered questions from his parents especially his mom. I remember one day when I got sick, Bima prayed for me. The next day, I was healed and able to work again. Through my son, God showed me that he is real. Bima challenged me to have faith in Jesus. During the COVID-19 shutdown, Bima's after-school program continued virtually, with teachers helping and encouraging kids through video calls. This is Bima's teacher. We created a video group for tutoring and to help kids watch Superbook. Orphan's Promise also delivered food packs to Bima and other vulnerable families in the program who have been hard hit by the economic shutdown. I wanted to thank the people who support Superbook and Orphan's Promise because through your help, I am now changed into a new person and I am happy. Thank you. That thank you goes all the way to you if you're a member of the Superbook Club. If you're not a member, you can help children around the world learn the stories of the Bible just by becoming a member. And when you join, we'll send you three copies of our newest episode, Gizmo Go, The Wind-Up Robot. And you keep one DVD and you'll have two others to share. It's all yours for a recurring gift of $25. So If you want to join, call 1-800-700-7000, or you can visit CBN.com to join the Superbook Club. Now, what's happening with Superbook, our surveys are showing incredible viewership. We're literally in the hundreds of millions now, uh, and we're pressing on to our goal to have 62 languages. So your gift will go into the translation costs, the distribution costs, the production costs for Gizmo Go. You'll help the, the children of the world get the stories of the Bible. And when they get them, they respond. We're seeing incredible stories from the Muslim world, from the Hindu world, from around the world. You can be a part of all of it by joining. So call us, 1-800-700-7000.
Well, there's no shortage of so-called woke books for children. As Bethany Bomberger points out, all these books have skewed one way politically until now. Author and educator Bethany Bomberger and her husband Ryan are co-founders of the Radiance Foundation, a faith-based organization that illuminates the truth about difficult social issues, such as abortion. She believes children are naturally pro-life and can be empowered, even at an early age, to stand up for what's right and good. In her book, Pro-Life Kids, Bethany teaches an age-appropriate worldview of the abortion culture and reinforces the value of human life in and out of the womb. Well, Bethany is with us now via Skype. Bethany, thank you so much for being with us this morning. It's a joy. I'm so glad to join you. All right. Well, let's start with your story. At one time, sure. you found yourself pregnant and unmarried. Mm -hmm. Then something happened when you saw the ultrasound of your baby. Tell us about that. Yes, well, I was in my 20s and I had found myself uh, stepping away from the Lord in my faith and ended up in a pretty abusive relationship and found myself pregnant. And I was really encouraged by my colleagues and, and by the biological father to choose adoption, uh, choose abortion, excuse me. Um, and I knew in my heart that that was not going to be an option for me. I had stepped into an ultrasound, which I always feel is quite profound because it happened to be on February 14th, back in 2004. Uh, and that morning while I was by myself in that ultrasound, I was able to see what looked like a little grain of salt just blinking. And that was my daughter's heart. And as I laid there, I just felt the presence of God and his heart just embracing mine and my daughter's. And I made a decision to turn my heart back to the Lord. That night, I went home and opened up an old journal. And there in the margin was Psalm 34, 5, which says, I sought the Lord. He delivered me from all my fears. And those that look to him will be radiant and their faces will never be covered with shame. That night, I exchanged the shame of that relationship and the things, the emotions that I had and I said, you know what, Lord, I want your glory to overcome and I will choose life for my daughter. That night I named my oldest daughter Radiance, which then turned into uh, really the name of the organization that my husband and I have um, led for 13 years. Yeah. But it's just because God never gets tired of exchanging his radiant glory for the right. shame, regardless of what issue. Amen to that. It was such a beautiful story. Well, let's talk about abortion. Abortion is such yes. a graphic topic. Are children too young to be taught about the issue? Well, I'll tell you what. I've been a teacher in public schools and private schools and a homeschooling teacher, a homeschooling mama for 17 years. And I would say that children can learn what is right and good from a very young age. And it is okay to hit social issues and talk about them um, from, from an age-appropriate perspective. And guess what? We know that there is a targeted agenda to normalize sin and normalize abortion among our children today. And so as pro-life adults, we have to be intentional about speaking about and teaching our children before a broken world reaches them. And we're able to do that when we have the right tools, which is why I actually wrote the book, Pro-Life Kids. It's my heart to exchange the fear that most adults have when it comes to talking to children about very difficult issues and replace that fear with a confidence that comes when you know you have a tool yeah. to engage in a conversation that will have long-term effects. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what are some of the ways to talk to children about the about abortion uh, from different age ranges? Sometimes I really think that we make fostering a pro-life worldview among kids a lot more complicated than it needs to be. You know, it's pretty natural for us as parents to teach our children to be kind to others, to understand that humans have value and that we can love other human beings. I always say we can love other human beings doesn't mean we love all human doings, but still just starting with a foundation that says that we value other humans humans, regardless of their size, their age, their circumstances that surround their life. But there's a lot of ways that we can foster that. We can talk about humanity. We could talk about children that are unborn. We could come alongside pregnancy care centers and different programs at our churches that are helping to step in and help mamas that are possibly in some crisis pregnancy situations. And we can do things as simple as 
creating a, a letter or a picture for different people in our neighborhood or different mamas that are walking through th through different difficult times while they're pregnant. Absolutely. Well, you have spoken about training children to become factivists. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, I think that the, we always hear the buzzword activists, but when you are an activist, sometimes you're just moving off of pure emotion. And we believe that when we have a biblical perspective, that although our emotions are involved, there's facts that are involved. There is a biblical standard by which we need to weigh every single bit of information that is coming in. So it is my passion to see children um, from very young ages understand that God made us emotional people, but he has something to say about every issue. And when we understand what he says, then we can look at these issues from a biblical perspective and not just an emotional one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, tell us about your husband's adoption story. Did that motivate you and Ryan to adopt? Oh, very much so. You know, we co-founded the Radiance Foundation. It's now been about 13 years. And because we have both experienced incredible transformation in our life, it's really propelled us into doing what we're doing now. Ryan was adopted after being in foster care for six weeks, and he was adopted into a very loving family. And this happened after Ryan's birth mom conceived him in rape. Wow. She chose actually to go through nine months of a, a very traumatic pregnancy and chose to give him the gift of life and the gift of adoption. Both are very courageous gifts. And that, of course, when we think about the choices that his birth mother could have made and how other people would have been fine with them, I realized that there could have been uh, a missing piece in my life and not a Ryan Bomberger, mm -hmm. but courage stands up and says, with God, we can overcome difficult situations yeah. and absolutely. women can choose life affirming absolutely. choices. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Bethany, thank you so much for being with us today. The book is called Pro-Life Kids and it's available nationwide. Bethany, thank you again for being with us and God thank bless you. you and your husband and your ministry. Awesome. Bless. Gordon? Well, here's a word from Proverbs chapter 31. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves ensure justice for those being crushed. Let that be a watch word for you today. God bless you. For all of us here, may you have a very wonderful day. We'll see you again tomorrow.